This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks for letting me do this for so long. Friends, a question entered my head recently that I just can't shake out. With the recent release of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet and with the official Pokemon YouTube channel releasing a video celebrating how this series now has over 1,000 Pokemon to its name, I wondered to myself just how easy or hard is it to catch all of those? You know, we've had a few decades of Pokemon games to look over and for a while the motto was gotta catch them all, so I'm wondering to myself which generations were easiest, which were the hardest, and if it was truly possible in any of them. Did Pokemon set up this impossible task to keep children busy? Because damn, there are over 1000 of them now and that's a hell of a task for anyone of any age. I don't really have a format to this video in mind apart from going through the generations and seeing how generous Game Freak were with the distribution of Pokemon. I will say that I'll be looking at every Pokemon possible to catch within a generation, but not beyond its national decks. So when we get to more recent games, it's just what they could fit on the cartridge. If they're a part of the Pokédex, mythicals absolutely count by the way. You'll come to hate them as much as me by the end. So, let's get started with the first generation, which is both the simplest to understand, and also, obviously, the gen with the least Pokemon. The total of 151 sounds pretty reasonable, and given that the only games you could ever get Pokemon from are Red, Blue, Yellow, and Pokemon Stadium, it's not too bad. If you only had one game, you should probably pick either Red or Blue, since for some reason, Yellow has more missing Pokemon and you can't even evolve your Pikachu. You need to get every starter Pokemon, so that would require another game, and Red and Blue's 11 exclusives in each game practically necessitate owning both. The big elephant in the room is Mew, which is the final biggest step in the way of collecting all 151, and as a mythical event exclusive Pokemon, there's no way to catch this thing out of physically going to the right place about two decades ago. Yeah, that's what we're dealing with today. Luckily, Gen 1 is super duper janky, and if you're willing to embrace glitches, anything can happen. Not the intended way by any means, but the intended way is stupid, and I fucking hate mythical Pokemon. But we're just getting started, aren't we? As the sequels to Red, Blue, Yellow, Gold, Silver, Crystal are much like those games, but more. 100 more Pokemon for a total of 251 and one more unobtainable mythical Pokemon, with Celebi only distributed properly in Japan via the GS Ball, although other regions had the same kind of retail distributions as Mew had. However, that was more than 20 years ago, and obviously there's no support for Gen 2 anymore, so that's Celebi and indeed Mew that you have no chance of catching. And yet there's more, because even though Gen 2 is a Gen 1 sequel and features a lot of Kanto Pokemon, and even takes you into Kanto in the post-game, there's a grand total of 18 Kanto Pokemon that are completely absent from this generation. That includes the Kanto starters, the Kabutops and Omastar lines, the Legendary Birds, and Mewtwo, and of course, Mew. So you can catch most of the 251 Pokemon available, but if you want all of them apart from Mythicals, you're gonna have to get to trading. Trading across generations will usually net you most of a generation, so that's worth remembering as we get into more complicated and yet interconnected Pokemon games. Gen 2 is a little more challenging because it can only call on one other generation for Pokemon, but 251 is not a lot of Pokemon really. Those come later. If you know anything about generational Pokemon gathering, then you'll know that Gen 3 is absolutely ridiculous. It's a strange one, because you'd think that collecting Pokemon will be made easier as more Pokemon are added, and Hoenn boosted those numbers up to 386, but Hoenn is kind of a standalone region. You don't get Johto in the post-game or anything, so you've got the Pokemon that Game Freak want you to have, and basically nothing more. The one bonus is that they remade Gen 1 in this generation, so you've got a pair of games that have everything you need for Kanto, except Mew, obviously. Although Mew was available for a different event, which is still unavailable nowadays. But hold on, I feel like we're missing something here. Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald will do you for Hoenn Pokemon, and Fire Red, Leaf Green will help you out with Kanto, but what are we doing about Johto? Ah, uh, basically nothing. Yeah, sure, you have a few Johto Pokemon left over in Hoenn, and the Kanto remakes let you find some of Johto in the post-game, but other than that, there's a huge chunk of the Pokedex that is very hard to fill in. Gen 3 can't communicate with the Game Boy games in any way, so you can't trade them over from older generations, which puts you at the mercy of the extended Gen 3 family. 
Oh yeah, because buying at least three GBA games wasn't enough. If you want to complete your Pokedex in Hoenn, you need to shell out for some home console Pokemon games that range from filling up at the Johto Buffet in Colosseum and XD Gale of Darkness, to playing all of Pokemon Channel for a Jirachi, which technically isn't event exclusive, as long as you live in Europe or Australia. Evidently, this is a crazy amount of work to tick off virtual boxes, and it's not even enough because Deoxys is a new mythical Pokemon, so you can't have him either. At least until they remade Hoenn, but that's not happening for a few generations. Have fun feeling incomplete. And so we rumble on into Sinnoh, and you'd imagine with the total Pokemon reaching the dizzying heights of 493 that things only get harder from here, but how's this for a plot twist? They actually don't. Gen 4 games can talk to Gen 3 games, which is an advantage for a start and potentially justifies all the purchases you made to catch everything in those games, but Gen 4 came with an even bigger benefit. Can you see it? Can you can you see what I'm talking about? It's on there somewhere. <laughs> Wi-Fi connectivity was the biggest game changer for collecting Pokemon that this franchise has ever and will ever see. Now you're only really limited by your patience and how much time you'll want to spend in GTS hunting for the missing gaps in your Pokedex. And this would be true if mythical Pokemon could be traded across GTS, but wouldn't you just know it? All mythicals are banned from being traded this way, which is doubly annoying since there are now seven mythical Pokemon in total. Which isn't too crazy if you've kept up with the events at this point and can move across your Mew, Celebi and Deoxys, but you need to get to work with the new events for Darkrai, Shaman and Arceus. At least Feeny and Manaphy are obtainable through Pokemon Ranger, but Arceus wasn't even distributed properly and only given out as a gift Pokemon instead of its in-game event. Don't need to tell you that these games are no longer active, but it's actually worse than that, since Wi-Fi for DS games is no longer officially supported by Nintendo, and so without the use of fan-made servers you can't rely on online trading at all, at least in any official capacity. How do these fuckers sleep at night? Unova has a similar issue to Sinnoh in that Nintendo's closing down of the servers means that any Wi-Fi shenanigans that could have made your life easier are now reserved for fan-made servers instead. It's a fairly standard generation that does two things very differently that ultimately make catching every Pokemon a slightly bigger headache than it already was. The first is that this generation has no third game acting as a definitive edition, and instead each of Black and White have their own sequels. All this means is that you can't buy the third game and catch most of the version exclusives since the sequels have their own exclusives and are just trying really hard to funnel you into a decision where you buy all four games to save yourself some trouble. The other bump in the road is how Unova handles foreign Pokemon, since every game before this had a mix of new Pokemon and old favourites, but Gen 5 made the drastic decision to simply have Unovan Pokemon appear during the main story. This dramatically reduces the number of Pokemon you can catch until you've beaten the game, and then it's a mad dash to collect the hundreds of mons you missed out on. This also means that there wasn't enough space for every non-Unovan Pokemon, but even without online play, this gen does communicate with Gen 4 just fine. However, it's worth remembering that no previous generation was remade in Gen 5, so you can't fall back on something like Heart Gold and Soul Silver to fill up the Johto decks without also trading those from Gen 4. There's still four more mythicals, and with the exception of Keldeo turning up in Sword and Shields DLC, these Pokemon have never been made available through anything other than events, which again, don't exist anymore, at least not for Gen 5. This lack of connectivity is such an issue for older games, but don't worry, I'm sure they'll sort it out one day. For their sake, I hope so. Gen 6 is an important milestone because while I've always been aware of completing the Pokedex, this was the first generation where I actually put some effort towards making that happen. The Wi-Fi connectivity is stronger than ever at this point in history, and since Nintendo haven't waved around their shutdown hammer yet, you can still use official 3DS Wi-Fi servers to this day to help out here. Kalos went back on Unova's decision to only have new Pokemon during the story and kind of rams old Pokemon down your throat at every moment. And given that this generation's gimmick is Mega Revolution, it's kind of telling that only one Kalos Pokemon got a Mega Revolution and it was on a mythical Pokemon. To that end, Gen 6 actually has the lowest number of new Pokemon of any generation, so the task isn't made that much harder just because there's new games out. Mythicals are both improved on and are still kind of annoying since there's three of them, and again, there's obviously no more events for this game in particular, but at least for Gen 3 remakes took Deoxys out of that bracket forever since he's available to catch in the postgame. 
There's only two other slight headaches here. The first is that we never got Pokemon Z, so the version exclusive from X and Y were never combined into one game. And the second is X and Y's Friend Safari, which can contain rare Pokemon, but there's a smallish list of Pokemon that can only be caught in Friend Safari. So if you haven't picked up any friends so far on this journey, well, now is a pretty good time to do that. Who knows, maybe they'll even touch trade the box legendary you don't have. So I've got a bunch of other stuff to say about Alola, which I'll get onto in a second, but I want to start by saying that of the five new mythical Pokemon introduced this generation, three of them are indefinitely active. That just means that instead of worrying about missing out on events, you can rely on always being able to catch enough Meltans in Pokemon Go to evolve it into Melmetal, and the QR code for Magirna isn't going anywhere either. I want to see more of this game, Freak, I really do, because while the mythical events work at the time, they're horrible for the future of your game. Continuing on from Gen 6, Gen 7 is more of the same, but this is now a generation where Game Freak decided to introduce more new Pokemon, and 809 is still the most amount of Pokemon you'll ever need to catch in order to confidently say that you've caught them all. Alola's unique ecosystem means that a huge amount of the roster isn't available in any of the four games that take place in this region, and so you are going to need to make smart use of trading, but it does rely a little too heavily on what you may have caught from previous generations. Game Freak are undoubtedly hoping that you're a long-time fan of Pokemon instead of someone who's experiencing Pokemon for the first time with Gen 7, because if you don't have that backlog, you're kind of screwed. And yeah, despite most of the mythicals being reasonable, there's still two more that are tricky assholes to pin down. And I can personally live without Zara Aura, but Marshadow is awesome and I wish I had one. At least the events are online now, so we don't have to drive to a toy shop and absorb judging looks from mums who've brought their eight-year-olds to the same event. Thank you, Wireless Fireless! <laughs> So Gen 8 is immediately different to everything that we've talked about so far because, as I'm sure you're aware of at this point, the 8th generation is the first to cut Pokemon out of its national decks. Sword and Shield basically don't have a national dex, but thanks to DLC and free updates, the total was pushed up from 400 to 651, I think. The DLC has separate Pokedexes, and I think there's a degree of crossover between all three Pokedexes, so let's just say that there's more than 600 Pokémon to gather up if you fancy maxing out all of these separate Pokedexes. Splitting it up like this was likely done so that Game Freak wouldn't have the finger pointed at them for hiding half a Pokédex behind paid DLC, but I feel like it makes it more manageable as a result. Something that Galar benefits from immensely are the various wild areas, since you don't have to worry so much about scouring the entire landscape for Pokémon, because most of them are found in the same, albeit massive, location. The one downside is how Sword and Shield runs on real time, so certain evolutions are locked to times of day, and some Pokémon won't even spawn in the overworld unless it's a THURSDAY, so it does require a lot of patience or manipulation of the Switch's internal time and date, but it is definitely possible. Gen 8 introduces just the one mythical, which isn't too bad, but this generation gets a ton of points since the smaller Pokedex means that only 8 mythicals are given a Pokedex number. For sure you can bring Jirachi or Arceus or that bitch Mew across from older games, but they don't count as a part of any Pokedex in these games. Oh my days, what a big win for Dexit! Never thought I'd see the day! And finally, we have Gen 9, which after everything that we've been through and everything that came before it, is like a huge sigh of relief. Maybe it's helped out by how recent these games are, and presumably the DLC that comes later will make completing the Pokedex more complicated, but as things are now, the Pokedex is 400 Pokemon long with zero, count them zero, mythical Pokemon. Oh my god, it's like a dream. I'm not sure if that's a sign that Game Freak have learned their lessons with mythicals, or more likely that they'll get added later through events, but at least those events are active right now. And since the Pokedex is a lot smaller these days, much like with Gen 8, previous mythicals aren't counted towards the Pokedex, so it's a win-win. That 400 total was super reasonable too. You can pick up all the starters from trading, and even though there's a surprisingly large number of version exclusives, mainly because of the Paradox Pokemon, the only challenge is the other box legendary, and even that can be fixed by touch trading with a friend which I'm sure you have at this point. Incredibly, this might even be the easiest generation to complete the Pokedex given how few hurdles are in your way. Whether or not this remains the case at the end of this generation, we can only wait and see.
So just to round up everything that has been said in this video, you can generally make the assumption that collecting every Pokemon in older games is usually harder than doing the same in newer games. Wi-Fi trading turned an occasionally impossible task into one that is now far more attainable and has helped to offset the challenge of catching more Pokemon as new are created. I think to finish off, I'll just do a quick easiest to hardest because you guys tend to enjoy that kind of stuff and it's what this video is about. The easiest is Gen 9 since at time of writing there's no mythicals and the total Pokemon required isn't too bad. Next is probably Gen 1 which has the least to catch but still requires a friend with the other version to yours and a Mew that can be caught either legitimately or with a time machine. Gen 2 is up next since it's basically the same setup as Gen 1 but with more Pokemon and another mythical. Next is probably Gen 8 which has a lot more to do than in Gens 1 and 2 but gets a pass since the National Dex is so much smaller. Then I'll say Gen 6 because it relies on carrying Pokemon through older generations so much, but it's so interconnected now that you don't have to fret a lot. Gen 7 is 4th because it's a lot like Gen 6, but the total Pokemon required is the largest it's ever been, and that can be a challenge to take on. Then probably Gen 4, because it can only talk to one other generation and that generation can't help it out too much, but it introduced Wi-Fi and that will always be helpful, even unofficially. The runner-up is Gen 5, mainly because the lack of foreign Pokemon in the story means that as soon as you beat the game, you've got a ton of work ahead of you. And obviously, the hardest generation for catching them all is Gen 3. No connectivity of other generations and some painfully hard Pokemon to find. Do not attempt this if you place any value on your time and money. And yeah, that's it for now. Do you agree with my assessments or do you have your own idea of the hardest generation to complete? Let me know in a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe for more in the future and hit that bell for notifications of every new upload. If you need something else to watch right now, I ranked every Mario platformer last week. And I also want to thank my top supporters on Patreon, including Sarah Malion, Scott Riker, and the Green Scorpion. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, guys.